Hello, everyone. Hi there. Uh, good morning to some of you. Good afternoon to uh, some of you. I am in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, so it is afternoon for me. Um, thank you to STN for giving me the opportunity to speak with you guys today. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Um, my name is uh, Professor Quinn O'Rear. I'm the Associate Chair of Film and Television at the Savannah College of Art and Design's Atlanta location. Um, and so I oversee all of our film department in Atlanta. Um, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about our department um, after uh, our conversation today about directing actors. Um, and I will leave some time at the end of the presentation uh, to answer any questions you guys have either about uh, directing actors or auditioning um, or about SCAD and uh, uh, film in general. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's jump into it. A bit of a presentation and I do have some videos embedded uh, in my presentation. So what I like to do is share the hyperlink to those videos as we go. That way, if my shared screen, if there's any like playback issues on your side, you can easily click on that link and um, you can watch uh, via the link rather than the shared screen if that works better for you. Okay. So as I said, today, uh, we're going to be talking about something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart um, personally. Uh, I have a background in filmmaking, of course. I spent about 10 years in New York as a uh, freelance director uh, and producer, but before that I actually um, studied theater and my background is in uh, performing for theater, but also directing for theater. And when I was in uh, pursuing my undergraduate degree, my main focus was the relationship between directors and actors. And so that's what I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about today, specifically auditioning and directing talent. So this is a topic that um, can really make or break our films. And I'm gonna to speak to you today um, like directors because I, I assume um, a lot of you aspiring filmmakers either want to be directors or at the very least are gonna be working with directors. So really no matter where you fall in the whole scheme of film and television production, um, having an appreciation for the actors, the actors process, um, the audition process, is really going to help you in um, telling your stories and supporting uh, the production of the stories that are told around you. Um, so in order to get started, we really need to first talk about what is good acting. And this is a tough thing for us to really um, put our finger on because good acting is something that we often know when we see it, right? We, we have a good eye for it. We know when something is truthful and we oftentimes know when we're looking at good acting, when we're watching good acting. We also usually can tell when we're not looking at good acting. And this sort of dichotomy between what makes good acting and what makes bad acting is really, is really hard to put into words. And as soon as we start to put it into words, you start to see these different sort of adjectives and nouns and very um, sort of evocative terms come up like, training and transformation and presence and commitment and awareness and, and it all becomes very heady and cerebral very, very quickly. But what we're really talking about and the, the image that I like to use when I'm thinking about acting and thinking about working with actors is capturing lightning in a bottle. Because it is this sort of human element, this feeling that anything might happen and that we're watching someone authentically exuding behavior, experiencing psychology, putting into action something that feels authentic, right? Um, because we as humans were finally attuned to be able to um, relate to one another. It is biological for us to have empathy for one another. And because we have undergone such a rigorous process of evolutionary psychology, we take for granted that empathy is in our DNA, truly. It is chemical. And because of that, because we are so finely attuned to be empathetic creatures, we are also finely attuned to be able to tell what is and is not good acting. Um, 
the first step to really at least having a conversation about good acting, in my opinion, is to get on the same uh, language playing field. Now, as directors, we often are thinking about the camera and we're thinking about um, the lighting and we're thinking about shot progression and how everything's gonna cut together and what locations we're gonna use and all of the pragmatic things that go into film and television production, what cameras we're gonna use. Um, but when we are working with actors, we need to adopt a more sensitive vocabulary, a vernacular of terminology um, that is going to lay the foundation of a trusting working relationship, a sensitive working relationship, but also a quick one, because anybody who's been on a set before knows we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm going to share with you guys um, an acronym that breaks down four of the fundamental terms that most actors in professional um, training environments are going to come across and are going to respond to. And that acronym is GOAT. Um, no, not that GOAT. GOAT. G-O-T-E. And this acronym essentially stands for goals, obstacles, and the other tactics, and expectations. And of course, this is not by any stretch of the imagination the entire breadth of um, acting and how we would direct our actors, but this is a really, really great start for our process, not just in directing when we're on set, but also auditioning. All right, so let's talk about each one of these individually. Um, first, it is important to uh, call out that Robert Cohen, the um, acclaimed acting teacher, um, is first responsible for uh, coining this acronym GOAT, although he's not responsible for the ideas that associate each one of these words. So when we're talking about goals, what we're really meaning is what is each character's objective? in the scene. And we should be able to dilute this down to something that is extremely achievable, scene by scene. You might have um, an uber objective, as I like to call it, an objective that tracks the entire movie um, or the entire episode or the entire series, right? Uh, we'll look at some examples of auditions as we go, but when we're talking about a scene by scene playable objective, we really want to make sure that it is concise because no offense to actors, we don't want them thinking, okay? We want them feeling, we want them behaving. Okay, um, an actor, a well-trained actor is, a, is an impulsive being, is an individual who is very in touch with themselves and is able to react, right? Is able to behave, is able to immerse. What we don't want them thinking about is how what they're doing in this scene is going to affect what they're doing five scenes from now, right? I want my actors to be extremely present and in the moment, going back to all of these words that we might associate with good acting. Assigning a goal or an objective within the scene, it gives the actor an immediately relatable thrust or motivation. Motivation is a word that we hear a lot when we talk about acting. Um, but we want it to be immediate. We want it to be relatable. I want to be able to tell my actor what he or she wants in this scene and my actor to be able to hook into it pretty quickly. It should be scene by scene and trackable over the course of the piece, right? So you might have one individual want for one scene and another individual want for another scene. But if you string them together, you should see a arc. This is what we mean when we talk about a character's arc. Right? How their objectives, how their goals change and morph over the course of a movie or TV episode. However, it should always be attainable and specific. Right? It should be something that our uh, character can get in that scene. Right? Um, if we have two scenes, let's say it's a first date, for example, uh, we have a man and we have a woman, um, and the man, um, uh, I tell the man, you want um, to live happily ever after with this woman. That's what you want in this scene. Well, that's gonna be pretty hard to play, right? It's, it's way too broad. It's not something that is um, achievable within the confines of the three pages that is that scene. 
However, I can maybe make an objective. Um, you want her to hold your hand. Or you want her to kiss you. You want her to agree to a second date, right? All of these things are objectives that are attainable within the confines of the scene and are attainable from the other person, right? Um, so talking in terms of just a two-person scene is easiest when we're uh, when we're discussing this topic specifically, you can't have, well, I shouldn't say you can't. It is usually most effective for your actors to be pursuing an objective that the other person in the scene can give them, right? So if I have my man and woman on a blind date and um, uh, he wants, you know, um, her brother to go into business with him, uh, unless she's able to make that business deal at the table, that's not really going to be a great want. Now, he could want her to invite him to um, her family's house for dinner. That's an attainable, achievable goal within the confines of this scene that then can link us to the greater arc of him wanting to have a business deal with her brother. Um, that would be an uber goal or an uber objective, something that we track across multiple scenes rather than within one scene. So um, I wanna watch an example of an audition. Um, this is an audition from uh, the film E.T. Um, and this is the uh, original uh, screen test for uh, the boy who ended up playing that, uh, that iconic role. Um, I'm gonna share the hyperlink to the video in the chat for you all. So that if my playback is insufficient, you should easily be able to pull it up there. Okay. So I want you to, um, as we're watching this, pay attention, A, uh, to what Mr. Spielberg says beforehand. You, you have to um, pay careful attention at the beginning because it goes a little quickly, but this is one of the rare instances where we actually get the opportunity to hear Steven Spielberg provide direction um, before a scene. Pretty phenomenal. Okay. And uh, there's a knock on your door and a man comes in, a grown man, not your brother. And he's from NASA, you know, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And he has found out that you have a creature, he doesn't know exactly what, but he, he has found you have a creature in your closet. A creature that he's been looking for for a long time. And you've had this creature now for three or four weeks, you become best friends with it, and he wants to take the creature away. And he's come with a search warrant, and he's come with permission to take the creature away. And you're not going to let him. Okay? okay not gonna... Now, young man, I understand that you have an alien somewhere in this house. Is that true? Well... Is it true? Is there an alien in this house? Yes, sir. Well, as you know, I am from the government. I'm part of the United States government, and I am empowered to take that alien with me. But you can't take him away. He's mine. Well, but the government is bigger than you are, Elliot. And I, I really, I have all the authority to take him, and i got to tell you, I'm going to take him. You can't take him. Well... I'm afraid I have to, son. You can't take him away, he's mine! But it's not my choice. The president asked me to come here and get him. I don't care what the president says, he's my best friend. And you can't take him away! Well, it's, it's real possible, Elliot, that, that he'll come back and you can have him again. But we just want to talk to him and see where he came from and try to find out about other planets. And he, he probably is the key to a lot of things that we have to know. But how do I know you're going to bring him back? Well, I'm afraid, son, I, I can't guarantee it. I think he's afraid of you. That may be true, but the government tells me what to do, and I just follow their orders. Well, he's mine, and he lives with me, and he likes me. And he wants to stay here. He likes it here. Well, we, we wouldn't hurt him or anything. All we want to do is talk to him. But I don't want you to take him away. You know, I've had to talk to your mom about it, and she knows that the government has the right to do it. And who told you all this? Well, we learned about it. We know that he's somewhere around here. 
I mean, I do have a search warrant. I could look around the house. Tell me to keep you out. Right. Tell me to keep Well, I'll tell you what. If you let me talk to him for five minutes, I'll tell my boss that you can keep him. Would that be okay with you, if I could just talk to him for five minutes? Would you feel better then? Would you be happy if you could keep him if all I had to do was talk to him for five minutes? That might make your whole day, huh? Might make your whole life, huh? And then he'd be your friend forever, and I wouldn't take him away. Okay, I'll leave. Okay, kid, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, obviously there, I, I, I think that's a really great example. A, kids are so um, um, wonderful to work with. I know that a lot of people say that, you know, kids are really challenging. And of course, yes, they're kids. They're challenging to work with. Um, however, the trade-off is kids typically are so attuned to their imagination. They're so connected to it, and they are so attuned to their emotions, right? They, they can access these extremely complex emotions um, and connect them with pretty simplistic goals, wants, objectives. Um, and uh, Steven Spielberg, right beforehand, uh, basically gives him the, you know, uh, everything that he needs in order to succeed in this uh, improv. And that is, right, here's the given circumstances, here's what's going to happen, here's uh, the bad guy is gonna try and do this, and you're not going to let him, right? That's it. You're not going to let him. That's the objective right there. Elliot is not going to let him take E.T. away. Everything else is coming out of that, right? Um, what we call tactics, which we'll get into in a second, is when the goal is not achieved, you have to try something else, right? If I want something and I'm trying to get it and I'm trying a specific tactic in order to get it, and that tactic isn't working, then I have to try something else. So in this scene, for example, you see Elliot try first to um, hide him, hide it, then when he has to admit it, then he demands that he can't take him away, then he tries to reason with him, right? He, I mean, the, the crying is not just emotive, it is manipulative, right? Um, the, the kid is crying to plead, right, to, to guilt trip him. So, jumping back into our presentation uh, here. This, um, this brings us to the next, uh, the next piece of our acronym, which is obstacles or the other. And I personally like to include both of them because really good obstacles often come in the form of someone else, right? Uh, so in this case, Elliot, this is the, the NASA scientist showing up to take E.T. away. That's, that's the obstacle. And then there is the search warrant, the fact that he's from the government, the fact that uh, the president sent him, right? All of these are other obstacles that are in the way of Elliot's want. And if we want to create dynamic performances, we really need to think in terms of obstacles that we are putting up in place uh, so that our character is having a hard time getting what he or she wants. Obstacles can be external or they can be internal, but really good ones can be both, right? So um, uh, an external obstacle might be the size of this guy. If he tries to you know, get past Elliot and physically enter the house, right? His size would be an obstacle, but an internal obstacle might be the fact that maybe he, um, uh, Elliot, uh, is, uh, you know, he, he's a child and societally he is told what to do a lot of time. We, we watch a movie full of him being told what to do by his mother. So his societal role in many ways is an internal obstacle, whereas his size is an external obstacle. External obstacles often come from the circumstance and the other characters. And as I said before, the obstacles are the things that drive cycling tactics. Okay, well, this didn't work, I'm gonna try this. And then that didn't work, I'm gonna try this other thing. And the obstacles are the things that you as the director are putting up in the way of your actor so that your actor has a lot to work with, right? If, if the improv was just, you know, guy shows up and says, do you have an alien here, son? Uh, and Elliot goes, no. And he goes, okay, uh, never mind. next house. It, I mean, scene's over, right? Pretty boring scene. Um, we build dynamics through throwing obstacles 
at our characters. And a lot of that's in the writing, but you as the director, you are the author of the subtext. It is your job to pull the subtext to the surface. And oftentimes the way that we do that is through creating obstacles for our characters. Internal obstacles, on the other hand, can come from character, the character him or herself, and his or her perception of society, and his or her perception of their role in society, right? So, I mean, a, you know, a grown man version of this is scientist comes to the door and says, hi, you have an alien here. I, I, I would like you to give him to me. No, it's my alien. Okay, well, I have a search warrant. Let me see it, right? It's a completely different dynamic versus this child. And this brings me to tactics. Tactics really are the meat and potatoes of how we direct actors quickly and efficiently, because tactics are how we as individuals can immediately relate to a way in which we want to get something. So tactics, this is the action implemented toward achieving that goal. Active. Um, using a thesaurus is, is a really great thing to do. I actually have a book that I highly recommend, which is an action verb thesaurus. It is an actor tool or a director tool, which is just a thesaurus with nothing but action verbs. Because that's how we usually want to present our tactics to our actors, is in action verbs. Um, examples of action verbs, seduce, berate, reassure, retreat. In the case of the scene that we just watched, perhaps there are some of the action verbs are guilt, plead, demand. What are not action verbs and what usually is not effective in your directing is to say sadder, cuter, madder, more supportive, more desperate. Right. If you were to say to that kid as he was doing that, uh, no, 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 try harder, right? Cry more, be more sad. What you're going to get in response to that sort of generic direction is generic performance, unspecific performance. Um, whereas we each as individuals have an idea of what guilting somebody feels like, right? Or what demanding from someone feels like. But this idea of sadder or madder or cuter or more aggressive, that takes me as an actor outside of myself. Now, instead of me living in my body and trying to affect the world around me, if I'm trying to be sadder or be more desperate or be more aggressive, then my perspective actually comes outside of myself and I'm looking at myself and trying to think about how I look rather than how I'm acting, how I'm behaving. And tactics should be constantly changing. This is how we build dynamic, nuanced scenes that are brimming with subtext. When one tactics does not achieve the goal, then the tactic changes. And then lastly, before we jump into a quick exercise, this idea of expectations. What is the expectation of the scene when you're walking into it? As an actor, what does the character think or expect will happen at the beginning of the scene? So for example, let's say um, Elliot is waiting for his brother to come home um, because he's hoping that he has good news that he made contact with um, E.T.'s uh, alien spacecraft, okay? Let's say that's the expectation, all right? Um, he hears the door open, he runs down the stairs, excited to hear the news, and then there, his mom is talking to a NASA agent, right? That expectation brings us into the scene in a completely different way than if Elliot were to enter the scene with the expectation that there is a NASA agent on the other side of the door. I mean, one is obviously more dynamic than the other. By giving your actors expectations that are polar opposites from the ending of the scene, you can build these dynamics, right? Um, a lot of times also, you'll find that actors forget the beginning of their scene. 
they especially i mean if you've filmed a movie before or a tv show you know that we're going to film this again and again and again and then we're going to put the camera over there and then film it again and again and again and what happens over the course of eight or nine times that we've filmed this one two page scene the actors forget the beginning and start playing the end and we don't want to let our actors play the end of the scene it's very exhausting to be an actor right because you have to go on this emotional journey fresh with a fresh perspective every single time expectations can help with that reminding your actors of what the expectation of the scene is before the take or reminding your actor what the objective that they're trying to achieve is the goal right or Sometimes I will direct my actors, if it's a two person scene, I will direct one actor by actually directing the other. If this person is maybe not as desperate as I want them to be, rather than saying, be more desperate to that person, thus probably getting a generic performance out of them, I might go to their scene partner and give the scene partner more obstacles to put up in front of that actor. So let's jump into a little exercise. Um, and this is something that I highly recommend that you do no matter what it is that you're directing. This works for comedy, it works for drama, it works for thriller. This is a uh, level of script analysis that is usually thought of as part of the actor's process. But I actually find as a director, this is highly effective in not just directing my actors, but also thinking about where to put the camera and how to block the scene. Uh, and this is called breaking down or scoring the scene, all right? And what we'll be using for this exercise is a monologue from um, Julius Caesar. Some of you guys might be familiar with Julius Caesar. Um, this is Cassius's monologue. Um, and essentially all you need to know is that Cassius is trying to convince Brutus to overthrow Caesar, okay? And I'm gonna be doing a little acting for you, so bear with me, my apologies in advance. Why man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some times are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is a spare name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the name of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he is grown so great? So we have to do a little bit of um, mental gymnastics here because I'm just a dude on Zoom right now speaking a probably uh, bland monologue to you, um, maybe something that you've even had to memorize. I actually had to memorize this for high school and I just never forgot it. Um, so let's assign some attributes to this scene. So if I'm Cassius, um, we have to also imagine Brutus is in this scene and I have to now uh, figure out as the director, were I to be directing Cassius, what does Cassius want? All right, what does Cassius want and how is he trying to get it? The first step to this is to write it on the top of the page. For every single scene that I ever direct, I just write on the top of the page for each actor, for each character, what do they want from the other person? In this case, I've written, Cassius wants Brutus to help him overthrow Caesar. Pretty simple, right? Achievable within the scene, achievable from the other person, okay? Uh, this isn't something that's broad and lofty, right? We're not gonna necessarily do it right now, but if I can get Brutus to agree in this scene, then I'm successful, okay? So if that's what we're going with, and here's the other thing, there's not a right or wrong answer to any of this stuff. This is going to be based on the collaborations that you have with your actor. And the wants that you subscribe or the goals that you subscribe to a certain scene are gonna be completely different than the goals that I subscribe to a certain scene because we're different directors, we're different people, we're different authors of subtext, right? Uh, and that's what makes this so interesting is there's not a right or wrong way to any of this. Um, but this is the foundational process where you can start to get under the hood of the scene, see where you see the subtext and start to create that dialogue with your actors. So once we have settled on an, a goal, all right? So this is our goal, this is our G part of GOAT. Um, next thing we need to do 
is we need to identify our tactics, okay? And remember, those tactics are gonna be coming from our obstacles or our other person. So instead of starting with, well, how is Cassius changing tactics? I would probably look to Brutus. What is Brutus doing? I might give Brutus a piece of business, right? Business is, you know, uh, we put something in the hand of Brutus. I might give Brutus a cell phone. Uh, Brutus is um, texting uh, his wife that he's going to be home late, right? And she's mad at him and he's distracted. That's an obstacle for Cassius. Cassius now needs to get Brutus's attention, right? Maybe I have um, them walking. Maybe they're on the, uh, maybe they're on a bus and they get to their stop and, you know, Brutus is not all about this conversation, so he gets off, right? And, and Cassius is on his heels. Now, there's any number of ways that we can craft this. Part of it's going to be there for you in the script. Part of it you are going to invent as the director. This is why rehearsals are extremely important. And then I'm going to break this scene down into beats, all right? And beats are any time that my actors or my character's tactic changes. And the way that I notate my beats is through these little hash marks, okay? So to go through this again, why man he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus and we pet him in, walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at sometimes are masters of their fate. It feels like Cassius is doing something different there, right? There's a gear shift. There's a change in tactic, right? And again, my beat might be different from your beat, but this is where I'm putting my beat. The next beat change I feel is here. After that, here, and then here. So going back to our second beat, men at some time are masters of their fate. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar, right? It's, it's a gear shift to me. I, I mean, it, it, feels, it feels pretty obvious to me that that is a gear shift. We're experiencing a tactic change. Uh, weigh them. It is as heavy conjure with them. Brutus will start his spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the names of all the gods at once, again, feels like a gear shift. Now, once I have assigned these beats, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to assign tactics to each one. And those tactics are typically going to be in the form of action verbs. So this first beat, condemn. I am condemning Caesar, right? Who does he think he is? Condemn is a pretty powerful action verb. Next, men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. What am I saying to Brutus there? I'm saying, wake up, dude. Like, everything is within our control. I'm appealing to him, right? I'm saying, look, you want a better life, you want a different life, it's, it's, it's right here, right? You, you can, we're not, we're not creatures of fate. We have the ability to be masters of our own fate. Now next beat, Brutus and Caesar, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together? Well, I'm humanizing Caesar. I'm making Brutus realize that Caesar is nothing but a, a man, he's nothing more than a person, right? Humanize would be the action word that I chose here. And then lastly, entice. Upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he has grown so great, right? I'm trying to entice Brutus to see how within his grasp it is for us to overthrow Caesar. This could be completely different from the way that you score your script. But laying this foundation is going to be not just the cornerstone for how you talk to your actors, but it's also gonna be the cornerstone for why you put the camera over there, why you choose to have Cassius circling Brutus like a shark, maybe, right? It's because of these subtextual pieces that are underneath. And when we're on set, it, I, I, I walk on set with my script scored, okay? So that when maybe my Cassius is kind of missing the mark, uh, maybe it feels unspecific, uh, his delivery in a particular instance, right? Uh, why should that name be sounded more than yours, right? Maybe that line is just hitting me weirdly. It doesn't seem like he's made a distinctive choice. I might come up to my actor and I might just say, hey, so for this line, humanize him, humanize Caesar. Convince Brutus that Caesar is nothing more than a human, right? It, it gives me all of the sidebar ammunition that I need to make really quick adjustments when I'm on set because time is money. We don't have a lot of it. We got to move, right? 
hope, hope that makes sense. The last thing that I want to speak about before we shift gears and talk about auditioning is, is another actor toolkit, um, a, a tool in the toolkit that um, you as a director also have some access to, and it's called personalization. You might also hear it um, referred to as um, substitution, emotional substitution. Uh, this one is delicate. You want to be careful with this one, okay? Um, people have dropped out of acting school because of uh, theories around personalization, right? The actor studio um, uh, was originally conceived around this idea that for every character, you needed to mine your own personal pain. You needed to be able to um, excavate some, some interior passion that then you could connect to the role. Um, and a lot of people were actually becoming very, very depressed after prolonged personalization. Um, so it is no longer what we think of in terms of the uh, North Star, the end all be all of what we want to be approaching our, um, uh, our, our characterization or our directing from, but it can be a handy tool sometimes, especially to make something specific. Um, this idea of personalization is the technique of an actor utilizing personal experience as a substitution for a scene, scene circumstance, okay? So if I was to um, play Cassius, right? I'm both playing Cassius and directing my Julius Caesar, which is complicated. But say I'm, you know, I'm trying to get in touch with uh, an instance of me um, conniving. And so uh, maybe I'm having a hard time doing that because I'm such a wonderful, upstanding uh, human being that I never do anything conspiratorial. So maybe I think back to when I was a teenager and my sister and I uh, snuck out to go um, to a friend's house and watch a movie one night, right? And I'm trying to convince her, right? Because she's the one who drives. I can't drive. So I'm trying to convince her to sneak out so that we can go watch The Exorcist over at Teddy's house, right? Or something like that. I, my sister's not older than me. This is completely fabricated. Uh, but point being, I might, as the actor, look into myself for an experience or a piece of personal history that I can then bring to this experience. Of, um, of trying to convince Brutus to overthrow Caesar. Now, as the director, you need to be very, very careful with this because you don't want to send people to therapy, okay? Um, at least not based on your directing alone. So we need to be sensitive. Um, the committed actor is going to look for ways to do this naturally, especially if they come up um, in a uh, method-based training, okay? We've all probably heard of method acting, right? Well, this is kind of the idea behind method acting is that we're getting into our character, and we're staying there, and we're using our personal experience, okay? There are varying degrees of people who take that real seriously, and people who just kind of whip it out as a tool in the toolkit. Um, the inexperienced actor is gonna resist this, though, okay? And you don't necessarily need to turn this into a therapy session, but what I've found is uh, sometimes it can be effective for me to come up to my actor if I was to be directing this scene. And I might say, so you don't need to answer me, but can you think of a time when you schemed to get something that you wanted, when you schemed with somebody else, when you maybe had to convince somebody to do something that you knew was mischievous, right? If you can think of something, maybe that will help you access that uh, conspiratorial quality. Okay, because um, I don't want them to tell me. I don't want them to tell me about when they snuck out of their house with their sister to go watch The Exorcist in Teddy's house. I don't need to hear that, right? But if they can conjure the memory for themselves, then usually that gets them where I need them to be. So all of this is to kind of bring us to this, you know, greater uh, ethereal process called casting, okay? Um, and casting is debatably the most important aspect of filmmaking or um, television making in general. Uh, anything having to do with performing arts, debatably the casting is the thing that will fundamentally make or break whether the movie or TV show works. Uh, even Scorsese himself says more than 90% of directing a picture is the right casting. Uh, and so if you're like me, you're a fan of Back to the Future, you may not know this, but 
There was a different actor cast originally as Marty McFly, uh, a very serious actor of the day named Eric Stoltz. Um, and they cast Eric Stoltz as a second choice. They actually wanted Michael J. Fox, but Michael J. Fox uh, was tied up with family ties and he couldn't get uh, time in the schedule to film Back to the Future, so they cast Eric Stoltz. Well, they, ca they filmed most of the movie with Eric Stoltz and he was a method actor and um, I actually have a clip. This is a, uh, another one of my hyperlinks. Hang on, I'll put this into the uh, chat for you guys. Um, this is kind of just like a super cut of, um, this is just a bit of a super cut of Eric Stoltz uh, versus um, Michael J. Fox. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, there might be an ad uh, for you guys if you boot it up at home. But um, they, the music's really loud. I'm gonna kill the music. Um, oh, am I sharing? Hang on, I don't think I'm sharing. Sorry, technical difficulties. Here we go. Uh, great, so Eric Stoltz, as I mentioned, was a method actor and was just living there for uh, a prolonged period of time, right? And apparently he was really not great to work with. The, the, um, uh, he was, uh, you know, problematic with the crew, um, uh, you know, the cast, uh, the other cast members were trying to relate to him, and he was really getting into this character. Um, all this, of course, is secondhand. I'm sure Eric Stoltz is a great guy. Uh, but point being is they filmed most of the movie before realizing this movie ain't gonna work. So most of the movie that you know to be Back to the Future, um, a lot of it is actually reshoots. Uh, because they waited until Michael J. Fox was available uh, from his family ties, um, uh, from his family ties uh, contract, and was able to actually come on the set. Uh, and they uh, had to reshoot most of Eric Stoltz, who is a phenomenal actor, but was just not right for the role. He wasn't right for the tone of the movie. Um, and this brings me to this idea of defining character essence. Identifying character essence is a very challenging piece of what it takes to uh, begin the audition process on the right foot. Um, and character essence, again, is one of those really kind of loosey-goosey terms that putting your finger on is difficult. But we all have a sense of like whether an actor is right for the character uh, or not. So if um, if you developed a small obsession with Tiger King like I did um, a month ago, uh, you might have been following all the news around like who's going to get cast as Joe Exotic in the actual movie. And there were a lot of people like saying uh, Danny McBride, right? And Danny McBride is definitely uh, Joe Exotic in one version of the Tiger King movie. But Nicolas Cage is definitely Joe Exotic in another version of that movie. So the tone of the movie actually has a lot to do with it, right? Um, but looking at just the character, him or herself, the first question we want to answer is what are the character's key defining traits, right? What are the things that make Marty McFly Marty McFly, right? He is... Uh, charming, he's kind of, uh, you know, lovable, um, he's kind of a slick operator, right? What's the character's central external conflict? And then what is their internal conflict, right? So for Back to the Future, the external conflict is, well, he's been sent back in time and he needs to figure out how to get to his present, uh, his present uh, moment in time. And his internal conflict is a lot harder to put your finger on, but it's really about his father. If you watch the movie of Back to the Future, uh, the film really begins with his father being um, emasculated by the neighbor, right? And we find out that the neighbor is the bully from high school that has bullied his father. And so in some way, Marty McFly's internal conflict is trying to redeem his father, right? Redeem his father as a person that can stand up for himself. And in turn, Marty being able to stand up for himself. And how and to what ends does the character overcome obstacles is a big one. Is our character the type of person who's going to uh, fold at, you know, uh, least resistance? Or is our character someone who's going to push through, who's going to see things through to the bitter end? 
And how has the character's history shaped his or her everyday behavior? And that's why backstory is usually really, really important. You'll um, hear about directors who do a lot of journaling, actors too that'll do a lot of journaling about what their characters were like as children or um, how their characters um, you know, grew up, what their socioeconomic statuses were, uh, because that stuff can be incredibly helpful actually uh, for defining a character's essence, right? So when we have identified or I'm starting to hone in on this idea of character essence, uh, the first step to casting a project is to write what's called a casting breakdown. So whether you're casting your film or your uh, TV series or your web series or whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're casting that on your own or with the help of a casting director, um, the first thing that you're going to write typically is a casting breakdown, which is a description of, the, um, uh, of a particular role. And this is what you're going to send out to agencies or to actor databases like Breakdown Services or Backstage.com. Um, this is what actors are going to read and then determine whether or not they fit that character and whether or not they want to submit an audition for it. Um, and this information in a breakdown should include age range, pertinent physicality. And this is a really kind of touchy one because a lot of times directors will get in their own way and they'll think that uh, a specific physical type equals the character and they will be blinded to all the other options because essence is rarely physical. Essence is almost always behavioral or psychological. So um, with my casting and with my students, I always encourage um, everybody to not think physically, at least not at first, all right? Only if it is truly pertinent to the script, if we really need someone to be physically imposing because it is a story beat, right? Personality descriptors are what is primarily um, the most useful piece because for your casting breakdowns, um, a lot of you will do, uh, will ask for self tapes. You'll ask actors to put themselves on tape and send you the tape rather than, especially right now with um, the pandemic, we're not having in-person auditions, right? So um, now more than ever, you're gonna have self tapes um, sent to you where you provide the actor with an excerpt of the scene, they read it, put it on tape, and then send it to you. Um, tape, of course, being video probably on their cell phone. Um, the breakdown is often the only thing they have to go off of for that initial read, that initial interpretation, okay? So you wanna make sure that you that this breakdown is rich with descriptors. I really like adjectives. Um, Character breakdown, if insightful, right? going back to this idea of essence, what in the character's background has shaped his or her behavior, has shaped his or her perspective, or the way that they might interpret the scene, uh, the way that they might uh, assign their goals or their obstacles or their tactics. And then sensitive expectations, right? You wanna be upfront with that in the breakdown. If you have um, you know, if you're doing anything that is remotely sensitive, that people might not want to be involved in the project because of whatever this uh, sensitive expectation might be, you want to get that out of the way first, okay? Because you don't want to have an awkward instance later on set when an actor is now in a position that they did not expect that they would be in. And then be transparent about rates and give information about how they should be submitting. So rates, what I mean by that is, how much are you paying? Most of you guys are not gonna be paying actors in your uh, first projects and that's okay. A lot of actors are willing to work for free if they are reassured that they're going to be able to use the media, use the film um, for their reels, okay? Um, and you wanna be very clear in the breakdown about how they should submit their audition to you. Um, and you also want to state in the breakdown whether the role is a lead, a co-lead, a featured. Um, some actors don't want to be involved in a project if it's going to be a really small part. And that's okay. That's completely their right. Uh, you don't want to get, you know, three rounds into an audition before an actor discovers that because then they might be, you know, a little frustrated. So let's look at an example of a character breakdown. Allie Hamilton, female, Caucasian, 17 to 25. 
Allie is the socialite daughter of well-to-do parents in Charleston, South Carolina. She is well-mannered but feisty in constant conflict between her practical and proper parents and the passion that burns inside her. She falls in love with Noah, a working class boy who her parents believe is beneath Allie. Years after their relationship is halted by her parents, Noah comes back into Allie's life, forcing her to decide between the new man to whom she is betrothed and the man she never truly stopped loving. LD stands for lead. And there's a lot of rich character details in here. Descriptors, um, you know, we get some really nice adjectives. She's feisty, she's passionate, um, but she's well-mannered. Um, she's in conflict. We get nice backstory that shapes her behavior, her personality. She is from well-to-do parents who think that uh, the love of her life is uh, socially beneath her, um, and she's engaged to a new guy. Right? So all of this stuff is giving our actress uh, some very valuable tools when she's going to put herself on tape. So um, yes, those of you that are familiar with The Notebook, of course, uh, this is uh, Rachel McAdams' character from The Notebook. Um, and let's quickly take a peek at her um, original audition. So I'm uh, posting the hyperlink there. I think I saw a hand raised really quickly. We're uh, nearing the end of the presentation. We'll watch this, do a quick debrief, uh, and then um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, speaking to you guys, anybody who has questions. Um, so there you go. I will also be sharing my screen. What are you going to do, Al? I don't know. What about the last two days? They happened, right? Can't just take that away? No. I know that they happened. And, and they were wonderful, but they were very irresponsible. You know, I, I have a life back in Charlotte. I, I have a fiancé who's waiting for me at a hotel who's going to be crushed when I tell him what happened. And I don't even know if he's going to take me back, but I have to go talk to him. So you make love to me. Then you go back to your husband. Is that the plan? Is that a test out? I didn't pass it? Hmm? I made a promise to a man. He gave me a ring, and I gave him my word. And your word is shot to hell, don't you think? Well, I don't know. I'll find out when I talk to him. So you're not going to break your promise? That's what this is about? I thought it was about following your heart, Al. Or maybe it's about something else. Let's be honest. Maybe it's about security. Oh, oh, what is that supposed to mean? You know, he does have a lot of money, Al. <sighs> okay, now I hate you. Now I hate you. You don't think that I love Lon? You smug bastard. Haven't you been paying attention for the past? What do you think's been happening here? I don't know. I think I must have misread the signal. Yeah, I guess you did. You're bored out of your head, Allie, and you know it, or else you wouldn't be here. Oh. You arrogant Stay with me. N <laughs> stay with you? Yes. Why would I stay with you? Look at us. We're already fighting. Well, that's what we do. We fight, Al. We... You're not afraid to tell me when I'm being an arrogant <laughs> I'm not afraid to tell you when you're being a That's what you are 99% of the time. But I'm not afraid oh. to hurt your feelings, Alec, because they got a two-second rebound right before you back to the next thing. <laughs> oh. So? So? It's going to be hard. We're going to have to work at this, but come on. Don't take the easy way out. Oh, what easy way out? There is no easy way out. No matter what I do, somebody gets hurt. Well, forget about everyone then. Forget about everyone and me and him and your parents and then what you think you should do. What about you? What do you want? It's not that simple. Yes, it is, Al. No, it's not! Yes, it is. <sighs> Aww. 
Um, so to wrap things up, I think that's a pretty good example of an audition. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Rachel McAdams went into a studio to actually perform that with Ryan Gosling, um, and a casting director actually taped it and then would have sent it to the director. It, maybe the director was even present. Um, but typically, you will have um, actors send you self-tapes, right, at least for the first round. Uh, now, I do recommend um, never, ever cast somebody based solely off of one self-tape that you receive. Because you don't know if that was the second take they did or the 22nd take they did. You also don't know, is this person crazy, right? I mean, you haven't had a conversation with them. You also don't know if they can show up to places on time. Um, so even if um, your next step is to do a virtual callback, uh, to schedule a virtual time to speak with that actor and to maybe do some um, uh, reading back and forth, you can get a sense for the actor, right? Um, what I look for when I'm auditioning, number one, is the actor listening? Is the actor listening to his or her reader? Uh, a lot of times you might see an actor where you get the sense that they would be performing it exactly the same way, whether there was someone else reading against them or not. And to me, that is a shame because part of the greatest piece of acting is the electricity that happens between two actors, uh, it, the, the nuances, the subtleties that happen that we then call chemistry. Right? And even if it is just um, a reader that is nothing but a detached voice off camera, if you get the sense that your actor on camera is not listening and responding, reacting authentically, then it's probably an indication that they're not going to be that way on set either. Is the actor present? Are they grounded? Do you, do you get the sense that they are this vision of lightning in a bottle, like something could happen at any moment. Like you don't know what they're gonna do next, even though you wrote the thing a lot of times. When your actor is truly present, it should feel like the script is being written in real time, right? And so that's what you wanna look for, is not, oh, are they, are they gonna land this line the way that I like them to land that line? Sure, that maybe you have that sort of benchmark for yourself, but the sign of a truly interesting and captivating actor is one who gives the impression that they are spontaneously writing the script in front of you. Does the actor have the character's essence? That's why it's so important to define that character essence beforehand. What is really important about Allie, right? What do we as the audience need to be able to glean from watching her? This is why it's really important to not just cast off of self-tape alone, but to get on a virtual call or meet in person when we're able to, because you want to give your actor an adjustment, all right? This is a note, right? Um, even if our actor knocks it out of the park on their first read, I wanna give them some adjustment just to see how willing they are to work with me, just to see are they gonna be open to play? Are they going to be um, willing to experiment and to try new things and to get outside of their comfort zone? All of those things are incredibly important on the film set, especially for actors. Uh, if my actor is pretty good, but a pretty good robot, that's not gonna take adjustments, that's gonna be a challenge. I would rather an actor that is more, has more raw talent is maybe less polished if I get the sense that they are willing to work and take adjustments and, um, and be open to play. And then does the actor seem like someone you and the rest of the cast and crew can work with? Especially for you guys, a lot of you are probably either have been making short films or are planning to make short films once we're back on ground, or maybe you're being real innovative right now and making short films in isolation. Um, you either have got the sense or will get the sense that filmmaking is really hard. Right? This, this stuff is, is not easy. And when you surround yourself with positive people, it can be the greatest experience of your life. But if you, can, if you surround yourself with negative people, um, it could be the most miserable experience of your life. So you want to make sure that you, know, you don't need an actor who's just like ready to, you know, get, you know, to get completely dirty and you know, uh, roll around in the mud and you know, 
just like climb on a roof. You don't need a crazy person, but you do want a person who you won't mind being stuck with for 12 hours a day for five days a week. Um, great. So I hope that this was helpful. Um, I hope there was something in here that you guys can take away to your own work. Um.